a legendary cloth. Really, the question behind all of this is, is the shroud the burial shroud of Christ? A bitter controversy. But I think this is the real number one unexplained mystery, how the image was transferred onto the cloth. Now, experts try to unravel this ancient mystery. The Shroud of Turin is too beautiful. By remaking the Shroud of Turin. April 10, 2010, Turin, Italy. Thousands flock to see a cloth that has been wrapped in mystery for nearly 700 years. The Shroud of Turin has been hidden from public view for a decade. Now it's newly restored and back on display. But it's the center of a bitter conflict. Some think it's a real relic of the crucifixion. Others believe it is a forgery. I think the fact that it's absolutely unexplainable and the fact that it really exists, we're not talking about a hypothetical object. We're not talking about a relic of some description that might have existed and has now disappeared. We're talking about an object that is there. People can see it. It has been studied scientifically and it is unexplained. Believers see it as physical proof of Christ's death and burial. The image that we see on the shroud is of a dead person, of a dead man. One of the most striking aspects of the shroud is the way the, the wounds are visible. So it's a very stark reminder of the, the, the suffering that Christ went through um, during the, the, the Passion. <laughs> The Passion refers to the biblical account of suffering that Christ endures, ending with his crucifixion. After the Last Supper, he is betrayed and arrested. He is tried by the temple authorities, then dragged before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and condemned to death. He is brutally whipped by his Roman jailers. They taunt and mock him and crown him with thorns. Believers in the shroud contend it holds Christ's bloodstains from these cruel lashes of a Roman whip. The Bible tells how Jesus carries the cross to the site of his execution. He is crucified. wrapped in burial cloth and placed in a tomb. Nathan Wilson wants to determine the truth about the Shroud of Turin. He's an author, Christian, and Shroud skeptic. He believes it is the work of a medieval artist. For me, it is, I think, possibly a sign of one more religious fraud in a long history of religious frauds. Five years ago, Wilson made a shroud replica, which looks amazingly similar to the Shroud of Turin. He seeks to discover not only how and when the real shroud was made, but also who made it and why. I've been involved in a lot of discussions with the shroud, read a lot of papers, seen all the argumentation. So I sort of out of hand was thinking, this isn't real. It's a quest that takes him to new realms of science, history, art, and religion. Some believe that the Shroud of Turin is an actual remnant of the crucifixion. I think that it is the burial cloth, the burial shroud that was used on the body of the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth. But the skeptics are convinced the shroud is a forgery. 
And it kind of plagued me initially because I didn't believe it to be real. One of the main reasons being the fact that uh, it completely contradicts the way the Gospels describe the burial happening. The Vatican stays out of the investigation and concerns itself with matters of faith. The popes have come to Turin to venerate the shroud, their presence. In no case means that the church has officially stated this is the very cloth that wrapped the body of Christ. The official position is it could be. If it is not, we have by coming expressed our love of Christ and our desire to behold him one day. The shroud is a mystery. The faint image of a man on its surface is like a photographic negative. The shroud defies logic. If it is the burial shroud of Jesus Christ, it should date to the first century. But carbon-14 testing says it's at most 750 years old. While some say it's a forgery, no one has crafted a reproduction that everyone agrees replicates the original. The shroud controversy starts around 1355 in France. It was put on public display in the church of a powerful French knight, Geoffroy de Charny. The local bishop overseeing de Charny's diocese believes the shroud is a fake and orders it removed from public display. For the next two centuries, the shroud moves from owner to owner, arriving in Turin in 1578. The mystery deepens in the 19th century. An Italian photographer sees a positive image emerge on his glass plate negative, a clear picture of a man. Researchers realize this negative image property is like a photograph. But if it's medieval in age, it predates photography by nearly 600 years. While researchers argue over whether the shroud is real or a forgery, most do agree on its central properties, a set of properties any reproduction would have to have to be authentic. The image is a negative. The image shows neither brush marks nor light source shadowing. The discoloration that creates the image sits on the top layers of the fibers of the cloth. And, most perplexing of all, the image has three-dimensional properties. For shroud believers, these traits indicate it's a real relic, produced either by a miracle or a natural process in Christ's tomb. I think we could sum up the shrouds appeal in general in just one word which is mystery the scientific mystery of how the image was transferred onto the cloth we just do not know we know how it wasn't transferred onto the cloth there's a long list of what the shroud image isn't but nobody so far has been able to say this is what it is the fact that the image on the shroud is a negative caught the attention of Nathan Wilson Wilson had a friend paint an image of Christ on a pane of glass. He placed a piece of linen underneath and left it on the roof of an Idaho schoolhouse for more than a week. As the sun passed overhead, it imprinted an image of the face onto the linen. This led him to wonder if a medieval artist did the same thing. And so I started getting involved because I had a personal itch. I mean, I really felt burdened to be able to explain in some sort of low-tech, medieval savvy way how one could create a negative image on cloth. Wilson believes the image is a man-made creation. And he's on a quest to remake the shroud. In the hills outside Milan, Luigi Garlaschelli, a professor of organic chemistry, has been working for two years to recreate the shroud. Okay. 
This is my old house. I have my lab. There's all the hills. It's beautiful. Also a relic buster, he investigates some of history's most mysterious objects. But this time, he is not simply uncovering an artistic forgery. He's investigating an object that many tie to a spiritual keystone of Christianity. The key to understanding Christianity is the resurrection of Christ. If we speak of faith, it's not faith in the fact that uh, Jesus was born, uh, or that he lived, or even that he died. Uh, it's faith that he rose from the dead. The Shroud of Turin is primarily a memorial of his resurrection. It is the cloth left in the tomb when he rose from the dead. In the Bible, Mary Magdalene and some others arrive at the tomb to anoint the body on the third day, only to find the tomb empty. Mary receives confirmation from a messenger of God that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. For the Shroud of Turin to be a real relic of Christ, there are two theories. It's created by Jesus' dead body emanating onto white linen, or it's a literal snapshot of the moment of resurrection, a picture of a miracle. Very often people will say it's a photograph. Now, it's not exactly a photograph, but it does contain photographic properties in that it's a negative image. The shroud's photo-negative property may be the key to unlocking its secrets and investigators continue their efforts to replicate the Shroud of Turin. Relic buster and scientist Luigi Garlaschelli is trying to replicate the Shroud of Turin. His first attempt results in a total failure. Now, this was my first experiment. I had a friend, painted it with red paint, and laid a sheet over him. So this is your contact experiment? This is a contact experiment, and you see it has many differences from the shroud. It's uh, black or white, no shading, no half tones, and it's grossly distorted. You see the legs, and yeah. especially the face is yeah. just a mess. And the ears are all the way out here. Yeah, it's completely distorted because of the wraparound. Yeah. So this is a realistic print, but this is not what the artist in the Middle Ages wanted to get, of course. Yeah. This was too ugly. So the shroud is too beautiful yeah. to be real. This is a real print of a real body. So I think that an artist in the Middle Ages maybe tried this method first and the results were disappointing. Yeah, he was unhappy. So, yeah, and so he thought of something else, and namely, the rubbing experiment. Okay. Garlaschelli tries again. The body is relatively easy, but the face proves almost impossible. He speculates that the artist didn't use a real head, but a flat one, called bas-relief. And of course the head, to avoid the distortion, must be done with a bas-relief, uh, a very flat bas-relief. Bas-relief is an ancient sculpture technique where three-dimensional proportions are somewhat flattened. Actually, I think that if you look at the Turin Shroud carefully, you see this, this strange uh, yeah. mark here. This was probably the neck of the bas-relief. Uh, it cannot be the neck of a real person, and it cannot be a, a collar. The shroud still bears prominent scars of its turbulent past. It has survived at least two fires, including a fire during the 16th century, when the chapel where it was stored was almost destroyed. You see that there are a lot of spots on this linen. You see these water spots here around 
and also up here. Today, the image on the shroud is very faint. Scientific analysis detects only minute traces of pigment. Believers say it's proof that the image was not painted on. But Garlish Kelly believes the pigment has worn off over time, and those impurities in the pigment etch the fibers so that an image was left behind. The shroud has no brush marks, so Garlish Kelly uses a small pad to apply the paint. He starts with the high points of the body. Now I will start from the shoulder going down to the arm and you have to be very careful and very light. So this is this is all you do with the yeah. tracing, so it's very skeletal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I'm So you're basically you're sunk. basically just getting proportion by rubbing. Exactly. And then finishing with the exactly. free hand. It could be that another artist applied paint this very same way centuries ago. History tells us that the shroud first surfaces in France around 1355. Its owner is one of the most remarkable men of his age, a knight named Geoffroy de Charny. Geoffroy de Charny, so far as we know, is the first historically documented owner of the Shroud of Taurus. Where he got it, what he thought it was, is something that will long be disputed. He could have got this when he was on crusade in Anatolia and brought it back to his church. Relics were hugely important to cathedrals and churches. For one thing, they helped to lend status and authority. But perhaps more importantly than that, they were economic assets because churches and cathedrals constantly needed money. They constantly needed rebuilding and maintenance, and that cost a lot. They were always looking for money, and relics were a great way of getting it. The question remains, did de Charny think he was the owner of a relic of the crucifixion, or the owner of the work of a medieval artist, even a forgery? Now, what we are going to do is to improve the image. By With the upper parts of the body blocked in, they turn to the most famous and critical part of the shroud, the face. Now we will add the head. Okay. So where did you get this? I did it myself by trials and errors. You did? Yeah, with the blaster of Paris. Garlish Kelly has created his own bas-relief. The nose and... The beard are darker, okay. and so you start generally from the middle. And work your way out. Yeah, like this. And this is the neck. And then you add the uh, termination of the bar relief. Yeah, because it is on the With the image complete, there's one more step. We have to roll the cloth around the tubing and heat it into the shroud machine for four okay. hours. The shroud machine? Yeah, the shroud machine is basically an oven okay. with a fan here and heating elements and an electric motor and the hot air will be recycled. The shroud oven bakes the cloth at 290 degrees Fahrenheit. In just four hours, it simulates 700 years of aging. Well, now I've participated in two different shroud forgeries. Wow. So I'm, I'm doubly damned. But his investigation is far from over. Wilson's next step takes him to the site of the crucifixion itself. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, millions of people come to connect with the historical Jesus. A stone of anointing lies just inside the church. 
Beneath the dome of the rotunda is the traditional location of Jesus' tomb. Some believe the events that give rise to the image on the shroud happened here nearly 2,000 years ago. Nearby, a new discovery. So this is the field of uh, blood, Akodama. This is the field of blood, right? Yes. Here, where Judas, according to tradition, uh, killed himself uh, after the betrayal of yeah. Jesus. And wow. uh, it's here that we did a survey and found 73 burial caves dating from the time of Jesus from the first century. 73 uh, first century tombs. Yes, cut in into, the, into the slopes of... Uh, uh, the site. Wow. Um, the roof itself is from the... Crusader Nathan Pier. Wilson explores the first century tombs of the Hinnom Valley. The interior is quite intact. Wow. It's a fancy tomb. It's not like the tomb that was used for the burial of Jesus. In the this first century, tombs are located outside the city walls. Many are cut into the face of a limestone quarry. Exactly, yes. Wow. And this is uh, a tomb which uh, dates from the Second Temple period. And you can see it's cut into the scarp here. This is the forecourt where the family would gather in order to um, prepare the body. Right in front of the tomb. Exactly. This is where the burial procedures were undertaken. The body would be brought on some kind of litter. The family would gather around, and then various people would be appointed to cleanse and purify the body. The anointing. Anointing with oil, and then the wrapping of the body with the shrouded textiles. Okay, so let's go in and have a look. So this is the tomb, and uh, you can see it's fairly simple in size. It's about two by two meters. And then you have these burial recesses. These are known as kokrim, in which the bodies were placed. And then over here, you can see there's a, an additional niche where the bones will be collected uh, after the body had sort of decayed. The bones will be collected and placed there in secondary uh, uh, form. So this is very typical of uh, the Second Temple period. And indeed, this is the sort of tomb that uh, Jesus would have been buried in. Uh, the, the tomb of Jesus didn't, as one can understand from the, the textual sources, didn't have burial recesses. It had a, a kind of sort of uh, platform or bench to one side, and it was a new tomb, so the burial recesses had still not been put in in the time that uh, Jesus was brought to burial. So he would not have been slid into a space like this? He would have no, been placed on a platform. Like in an alcove yes. or something like yes. that? Yes. Well, this is quite it's cool. in a burial niche like this that Shimon Gibson makes a startling discovery. But the tomb itself here is typical of the Second Temple period, and very close by is uh, the Tomb of the Shroud, uh, which we excavated. This one, of course, has been open for 100 years or so. It was robbed out, but the other tomb wasn't. The robbers discard bone boxes outside, attracting authorities to the site. Gibson goes inside to investigate. I went into the tomb, which is difficult. You have to slide through the entrance. Um, and then I looked around and I could see that there was an opening to a lower chamber. Of course, this got me very excited. I descended to this next chamber. Then I noticed in one of the loculi um, what looked like bits of a grayish, blackish mud. But it's not mud, it's cloth. 
and climbing inside the tomb, we were quite shocked to find parts of a shroud laying within the burial recess. And that's very uncommon, isn't it? It's very uncommon, because as you can see, it's, it's uh, very humid in this area uh, in the winter months, and... Um, all organic materials uh, decay. And in this case, because of uh, special circumstances within the tomb, the raising of the barrel uh, uh, niche in, in the wall and other uh, reasons where it was sort of uh, blocked up, uh, the shroud was fairly well preserved. It wasn't like that you were in a shroud, like one sheet. We couldn't sort of roll it up and take it away with us, but it was in fragments, and it's the first time that a shroud from the time of Jesus has been found in a burial cave uh, near Jerusalem. Wow. Experts study the fabric, and what they discover sheds new light on the Shroud of Turin. The common practice at the time was to uh, have a shroud which would extend up to the, the neck, and a separate covering for the head. So multiple different pieces all the way yeah, up. Exactly. Down. Now okay. this was the common practice at the time. If the findings are right, it means bodies were wrapped in more than one large cloth. It's further evidence against the Shroud of Turin being the burial cloth of Jesus. Even so, some believers turn to history for clues that may prove the Shroud of Turin is real. Tradition says Jesus was buried at the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The Bible says he is wrapped in linen, which some believe is the Shroud of Turin. But there's a problem. Carbon-14 dating places the Shroud between 1260 and 1390, more than 12 centuries after Christ's death. This date places the Shroud alongside similar portrayals of Christ in medieval times. In earlier times, during the Romanesque period, one would tend to see pictures of Christ sitting in authority, Christ in heaven, making judgment over the world. During the Gothic era, more and more we start to see depictions of Christ as a man, as a suffering person, Christ's passion, Christ on the cross, Christ in torment and agony. So the actual experiences of Christ as a man started to, to take center stage. The shroud appears in France around 1355 in the possession of a French knight, Geoffroy de Charny. It seems to me that as a man whose religion is so fundamental and so open and public a part of his persona, would be unlikely to have hidden the fact that he had a relic from the age of Christ had he thought that this is what he possessed. This historical record matches modern carbon dating. In order to be from the time of Christ, the carbon dating has to be wrong. Believers in the shroud are convinced that there are other clues from history that point to an earlier date. Mark Guskin refers to a drawing from the 12th century that depicts a shroud with burn holes similar to those in the Shroud of Turin. It shows a little series of holes that are burned into the Shroud in the shape of a capital letter L. And these are shown very clearly on this manuscript, which was copied after the visit of a delegation from Hungary to Constantinople in the mid-12th century. The picture predates the Shroud's carbon dating, but some skeptics contend the Shroud as a forgery could be a replica of what's seen in the picture. Guskin says there are even older accounts, including a text from 7th century Spain. It says that what made the disciples believe is that they saw the image of the dead and rising one imprinted onto the, the linen cloths, onto the burial cloths. Before that, there's no reason to think, should there be an image on the burial shroud of Christ? And here we are in the seventh century with a text that tells us there was an image on the burial shroud of Christ. In 1203, a crusader writes an account of seeing the burial cloth of Christ in Constantinople. 
But the next year, Constantinople is sacked. The burial cloth disappears. Believers say that this is the Shroud of Turin that appears in France a century and a half later. But three independent scientific teams carbon date the shroud between 1260 and 1390. Also, dozens of shrouds and image printed cloths appear all over Europe in earlier centuries. But there's no evidence to confirm any as the Shroud of Turin. Still another possibility. What if the shroud was simply an icon created to inspire faith? Okay, now we will put the bas relief okay. under the cloth. And where Nathan where Wilson is? joins Italian relic buster yeah, Luigi Garlaschelli as he meticulously recreates the Shroud of Turin. It's hard to disagree with him because I have a certain measure of certainty that it's a forgery as well. No, I'm a Christian, so for me it's a question of what was Christ wearing on Easter? What was the resurrection outfit, if you will? If I'm wrong and the shroud is, is real, then my world doesn't shake. Luigi is an atheist, agnostic type, extreme skeptic, so his entire concept of reality would change. It would have to change because he denies the paranormal, the supernatural, or the immaterial completely out of hand. Over the course of two years, Garlaschelli has perfected his method of remaking the shroud. A key aspect of the image is that it shows no brush marks. Garlaschelli believes it was painted and that the pigment wore off over time, leaving a faint image etched in the shroud's fibers. Okay, you see now I have washed the cloth and I have removed all the blue pigment and the fibers are etched. There is no pigment left. Not one trace of pigment remains. Flat. And what we see now is the faint image. Okay. Uh, Garlaschelli has recreated the shroud's supposed blood stains with a mixture of red pigment and simple chemicals that were readily available in the Middle Ages. So now let me show the big shroud. Absolutely. This is exactly the size of the Turin shroud. And how, how long is that? Four meters, 40 centimeters by one meter and 10 centimeters wide, okay. more or less. This shroud has been aged for three hours in an oven, and yeah. the Turin shroud has been aged for centuries to get the same result. Yeah. Garlaschelli's shroud image is so convincing that even some who believe the shroud is real acknowledge it's a compelling forgery. I think it's probably the best reproduction of the shroud made up to now. It looks really good, but again, it doesn't answer to and respond to all of the different properties of the shroud. I think it's the closest thing yet, but it's still not the shroud image. The question remains, is the original shroud the work of a medieval forger? The answer may lie in the history of Christian art. In Judaism and Christianity, one of the deepest yearnings is to see God. Moses on Mount Sinai, when God spoke to him and gave the commandments, at a certain point made bold to ask God, show me your face. And God's answer was, man cannot see me and live. But all that changed with Christianity. Christianity believes that in Jesus, God became man. The word of God became flesh. So artists can now represent God in the form of Jesus. But fears about idols and graven images don't entirely disappear. Some branches of the church are still uneasy with representing the divine. Three-dimensional statues are thought to be demonically possessed. In the 8th and 9th centuries, iconoclasts destroy images and sacred icons. 
but artistic conventions usually do evolve to match changing theological ideas. The characteristic of Byzantine sculpture is that it usually works in low relief. That is, it telescopes three-dimensional forms into a shallow compass. That does two things. It eliminates shadow, which of course gives it away as a material object, and it creates this image of forms that have volume, but not mass. If the shroud were a print made from a Byzantine low-relief sculpture, this might explain the strange characteristics of its ghostly image. But still, two mysteries remain. Who made it and why? Since the Shroud of Turin appeared in Europe in the 14th century, many have accepted it as a genuine relic of Christ. But its authenticity has been in doubt. Even at that time, it was denounced as a fake, and it may not have been unique. William Dale believes there may have been others. Where I realized that we were dealing not with a unique work of art, but uh, a series of what you would call prints made by rubbing over low reliefs. For Dale, the image itself seems to suggest the way it was made. The image of the head particularly, the way the hair comes forward to the same level really as the end of the nose. Dale's description is strikingly similar to what Garlaschkelli believes to be the image-forming process. You know, when we were kids, we used to take a coin and put a piece of paper over it and then rub with a pencil, and you'd get the image coming through because the uh, lead would stick to the upper, the projecting parts. And so you'd come up with a quite respectable facsimile of the image on the coin. The bleeding of the last one. Two researchers using materials available in medieval times are putting the theory to the test. Nathan Wilson has brought along his own shroud forgery for Italian chemist Luigi Garlaschkelli to analyze. So now it's your turn to show me your results. Okay. I'm very curious. Where are they? Right here. They're right here and they're much smaller than yours. Easy. Maybe they look better. Easy to transport at least. Yep. Here's one. You can take a look at it while I... Wow. Really looks like the photographs of the Turin Shroud. That's a real good job. Thank you. Wilson really creates proud. his shroud forgery by placing a piece of linen under an image of Christ painted onto glass. He leaves it in the sun for more than a week, and the natural light makes an image on the linen. The passage of the sun also creates the soft gradation in the image that Wilson believes results in a 3D effect. Which things got picked up. Cheekbones are, all these are created by the same painting. Uh, this one, the face was parallel to the sun. So the same painting, the sun passed over from, from beard to forehead, you know, every morning. And this one, it passed over you know, perpendicularly to the face. Mm. Is there so a difference? This one, this one's just a stronger image. It's also more harshly three-dimensional. They subject their forgeries to three scientific tests. The first is to turn the image into a negative. As you can see, okay, now, here we have a black and white positive photograph of my shroud, okay. and we can very easily get the negative. Very nice. A bit. So the negativity is there. Yeah. It depends on the fact that I have rubbed over a bare relief, and of course, the yeah. higher parts will get more color and very uh, lifelike yeah. image. And this is your image. And in your case, of course, the negativity, it's the results of the fact that you had more or less 
Yeah. Oil painting on the glass. Yeah. In a certain the second place. test will determine if their forgeries have three-dimensional properties, yeah. like oh. the shroud. Do you have a 3D rendering program on here? Yes. Uh, with the same negatives, the same two negatives. Okay. This one is the Shroud of Turin. Okay, from the 1970s. Yeah, but we actually do not know how the original image had been, you know, transformed yeah. Yeah. and smoothed or, or. We don't know what they did. No, we don't know. It, it's rather flat, after all. Yeah. And this is mine. Okay. And I think that we got both some three-dimensionality yeah. encoded in the image. I'm curious now to see under the UV yeah. lamp our shroud. So am I. Uh, okay. Let's do it. The last will test how both forgeries hold up under UV light. The real shroud of Turin appears dark, with the images on its surface even darker. The shroud, the real shroud, is more or less like this, and the image is even less fluorescent. Okay, so the so this majority of the now, cloth is, is now like that. we will see my reproduction. The Luigi okay. shroud. Yeah. The background is slightly fluorescent, more or less like filter paper, and the okay. image is darker. Okay. So it's... What you As want. it should be. Luigi's forgery, aged for four hours in a special oven, has the same luminance as the much older Shroud of Turin. Now, let's see your shroud. Moment of truth, right? Yeah. And nice. Final test passed. The background is very slightly fluorescent. And I like your results. Garlischelli's experiment also fits with the idea that the Shroud of Turin may have been created from a bas-relief figure in the Eastern Christian Church. I'm not necessarily convinced that this is how the Shroud of Turin was made, but I've always dismissed rubbing theory out of hand, and now I think it's a viable option. It's something that has to be discussed. But why was it made? In the 11th century, the form of Easter worship changes. It begins to emphasize the lamentation over the body of Christ. Images like the shroud begin to appear at Easter services. So it, it really is a teaching icon, of one that was meant to tell the whole story of the Passion. That means that it had to be exhibited in a particular way. To put that upright, obviously you wouldn't have it full length, you would have it folded over. In fact, it might have been on something like a towel rack uh, so that you could turn it around one way and you'd see that you'd review the story of the scourging and the crowning of thorns. If Dale is right, the words forgery and fake mask the shroud's true purpose. He believes that it was created among Eastern Orthodox Christians as a holy object to fill worshippers with faith. The shroud is, in fact, an icon. As long as the shroud was in the East and in its original setting, it would be regarded as an icon, something that focused devotion on the sufferings of Christ particularly at the time of Good Friday and Holy Saturday. Once you take it out of that setting to the West, the Westerners, the people in France, didn't have that tradition. In other words, it became a, a literal relic, a relic by contact with the body of Christ. I am struck by the number of problems that would be solved if we could decide that the shroud is an icon rather than a relic, an icon of the sort used in the Eastern Church to increase devotion, rather than a piece of cloth surviving from the lifetime of Christ. 
But to this day, there are those who still believe the shroud is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus and that science will never be able to unlock all its mysteries. And I think that's what really draws people in in the end. It is that, that, that mysterious side to it that we are just not able to explain. No matter how hard we try, we just haven't been able to yet. And I don't know if we ever will. The Shroud of Turin remains controversial. For some, it's an authentic relic. For others, it's holy forgery. Or perhaps, the mysterious shroud may simply have been an icon, designed not to deceive, but to evoke and inspire faith.